Welcome to this presentation of Zeus Visual Intelligence. My name is Bert Gottlich and I'm the CEO of the company. Thank you for uh, inviting us to this uh, Congress and also thanks to the Dutch Embassy for inviting us uh, to this uh, occasion to present to you all the developments that we are doing internally uh, with the help of AI to improve digital healthcare. So my presentation will be about how AI can help digital healthcare to improve the healthcare system throughout the world um, um, on the basis of medical imaging and pharmacy automation. So today, the agenda today uh, will be, uh, I'll shortly introduce uh, my company to you, and then I'll be talking about how artificial intelligence can help drive digital health forward. And then I'll show you three examples of what my company is doing to make digital healthcare better. So we'll have an example on colon cancer colonoscopy. We'll have an example on hyperkinetic movement disorders. And the third example will be about pouch checking in pharmacies. So first of all, Zyus. So my company is a specialized company uh, with 65 people currently headquartered in Gorderdijk, which is in the Netherlands in Europe. And we are privately owned, uh, have been around for almost 18 years now. And what we are doing is we are trying to solve social relevant issues with uh, the help of visual intelligence technology. And I'll show you in a while what visual intelligence means for us. We're an innovative company, we're very customer centric, and we want to have impact. And we operate worldwide uh, with our headquarters in the Netherlands, but also offices in New York and in Shanghai, using our Shanghai office also as the hub for the, the whole of Asia, including South Korea. And we, wanna, uh, we are definitely determined to win. So everything we do, we want to win. Uh, that goes for all the business that we do and all the interactions that we have throughout the world. Um, we focus on three industries. Uh, the first one is not so relevant for this Congress, but I'll tell it anyhow. So what we do is we help police services and NGOs worldwide to help fight child sexual abuse. Um, we use visual intelligence technology to be able to go through huge amounts of CSAM, so child sexual abuse material, and to help police to make the analysis of that material. So second, we focus on the pharmacy automation and then explicitly for the visual checking of medicine pouches. And I'll come back to that later as one of the examples, how we use AI in digital health. And then thirdly, we focus on helping hospitals to help them improve on their medical imaging analysis and doing that in an automatic way using artificial intelligence. And we're talking about um, medical device grade um, uh, products uh, for that. So let's then first uh, see how AI can help drive digital health in general. So first of all, uh, visual intelligence for us means we use artificial intelligence driven method methodologies and technologies to uh, really drive the image analysis techniques. So help image analysis, which has been around for, for, for decades, but help that improve to a new level. And that doesn't mean that artificial intelligence is that silver bullet that will solve everything. Sometimes it's even better to not use artificial intelligence solutions, but to use plain old uh, image analysis technologies. And I'll give you an example also of one of the three in which we also use the, so the good old methods in doing that. Um, so second, uh, AI and AI-based solutions are getting to a level now which they can really play a big role in improving our healthcare system. Um, innovative solutions, but they have to be based, of course, on sound scientific research before we can use them, actually, and before we can help the medical experts, general practitioners, or uh, pharmacies, for instance, uh, to be more effective, be more uh, reliable, be more efficient in their work, in their daily work. And very important to know, I think, is that AI can help them. So the tooling can help them do their work more efficient or more reliable. It will never replace them. Uh, and especially in situation in which the workload uh, is, is, is growing tremendously. So what we see is that the, the amount of data that medical uh, imaging, for instance, generates on a daily base is growing to such extent that a human being, a normal medical expert, will not be able to do that anymore uh, by hand or by eye. Um, so the chart that, that is shown here is a chart from IBM from a few years back, uh, in which they predicted that the, the amount of data would double every, every 73 days. Um, and that has become true, actually. So we're not talking about gigabytes or petabytes anymore. It's about zettabytes. 
Um, and that is still barriers to overcome. So AI has a big potential in digital health, but there's still some barriers to overcome, having to do with acceptance by the patients themselves, but also the acceptance of the medical experts and the acceptance of the regulators and everything the regulators have to do to make sure that you can safely use AI um, in a scientific way. So let me show you the three examples that I have in mind to show you how AI can really help digital health. So first of all, there's the colon cancer colonoscopy. Um, so we're talking about the screening of small polyps in the colons and to be able to distinguish between the two types that we have, the overall types, the one being the, uh, say, the, the, the cancer types, so the adenomatous uh, type of polyps, uh, but the others, and th there are also a lot of them involved in columns, and that is the harmless hyperplastic ones. And the, the, say, the, the purpose of a, a doctor for such a colonoscopy um, uh, research would be to find these polyps and to decide amongst them. And that's really a difficult task to do. So um, the current practice today is get them all out. So you don't know which kind of polyp it is, so get them all out. And then the polyp goes to um, a, um, a pathologist and that he or she will do the trick in putting it on under a microscope and then really decide on is this one, is that a, a cancer type or is it a hypoplastic one. Um, but in the ideal world, you would know immediately. So before getting it out and sending it to the pathologist, you would know. Um, and that's, uh, um, I mean, and also because taking it to the pathologist lab will take two weeks. Uh, it's very expensive. And also the patient does not know right away uh, what the outcome of the surgery is. Um, and that is something that a patient would really like to know. So immediately know once the colonoscopy is there, is this good or is it bad for me? So we have tried to find a solution for that. And that solution is called POLAR. So POLAR is an acronym and it's, called, it's, it's about uh, recognizing automatically a polyp. And of course, being able to distinguish between the two of them, the two th different types, uh, by uh, immediately when you do the colonoscopy and not afterwards. Um, we use a convolutional neural network for that. And of course, we have to train that network and that's what we do uh, with a lot of data uh, which we get and what we try to do of course is make that solution in such a way that immediately by using that in um, the colonoscopy research you can decide as a medical expert should i take this one out of the body yes or no and not be able to or not having to send that to a pathologist lab um, Currently, we have clinical trials going on with both the Bergman Clinic and the Universal Medical, University Medical Center in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, and in the hospital uh, in Barcelona. Um, and we are currently in the phase uh, that we can say that Polar, our Polar solution, is as good or as bad, you could also say, as the average endoscopist. So it has a probability of 0.8. Uh, nowadays to distinguish between these two uh, type of polyps. And that is good or as bad as the general uh, endoscopist would do. But our aim, of course, is to be better than that. So our aim is to be as good as the pathologist. Um, and that simply needs more data. So we need more training data to train our convolutional neural network to be able to do a better prediction. And that's what's currently, currently going on within my company. So the second example has to do with hyperkinetic movement disorders. So hyperkinetic movement, movement disorders are uh, really the excessive, abnormal, and also involuntary movements that a person can have, like uh, tremors, or myoclonus, or uh, dystonia. Um, and the problem with these uh, movement disorders are, is that you have 25 different disorders, and it's very uh, difficult to distinguish between them. So um, uh, you see uh, a few pictures here and which show there's a lot of variance amongst these patients um, in the way that such a disorder is shown in that patient. So that, that it, it, it takes a lot of experience to be able for a medical expert to decide, okay, uh, if I look at a patient, what type of disorder does this patient have? Um, and because it's so uh, difficult, sometimes wrong diagnoses are made. That means that also wrong treatments will be given and that could have severe consequences for that patient. Um, and of course, the question then is, can IA help to improve this? Well, our solution for that is 
Nemo. Uh, Nemo is a project currently going on with my company and uh, Nemo is our next move in movement disorders. Um, and that is uh, a tool which is supportive to a medical expert in distinguishing uh, between all these different kinds of movement disorders. Um, and what we do is we use a 3D camera for that uh, in, together with uh, a lot of motion sensors to be able to see what actually what, what a patient is experiencing when he or she has these tremors or dystonias or some kind of other hyperkinetic movement. Um, so what we're trying to do with the setup using that 3D camera and using these motion sensors is that we create a database um, of all these kind of, of video recordings together with all these um, uh, recordings of these motion sensors. And we try, we use that as training data for a classifier to classify all these kind of hyperkinetic movement disorders and put that into an AI algorithm to decide up upon these images that we showed that. Uh, and it will help to diagnose um, for better treatment in the end uh, and better outcomes, of course, for all these patients. Um, and the first clinical trials have already started uh, together with the uh, University Medical Center in Groningen, which is in the Netherlands. And um, yeah, we use uh, also we need a lot of data as well there uh, to train Nemo in a better way so that the algorithm will become better in distinguishing between all these, these different disorders. Um, so, uh, and we have been impacted, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, quite a bit by uh, the COVID-19 situation because also in the Netherlands, also in our region, um, uh, hospitals uh, do take care, of course, of all these COVID patients. Uh, but that also means that there's not that much room anymore for doing the normal procedures that they would normally do. And that means that we have less data yet than we would have had without COVID being around. But of course, that is something that the whole world is experiencing. So th that's our NEMO uh, project, uh, something completely different from, from the first example, but uh, uh, I think a very good uh, example also on that it's also about multimodality. So not only vision, but also in the combination with, for instance, motion sensors. Um, the third example will be something completely different again, and that has to do with pharmacies, uh, especially with pharmacies that do uh, pouch medication. Um, uh, so putting pills into pouches to make sure that the medication adherence will become better. Uh, also known in South Korea, for instance. Um, and um, we're talking about uh, the way to do it is in a massive scale. Um, so uh, uh, these dispensing robots, which you see a picture um, to the left, is something that is um, on a scale that, that they can produce, say, for instance, for, for hundreds of patients a day, uh, many pouches. Um, but these dispensing robots uh, are not uh, flawless. They make roughly one error in 100 pouches, um, which is not that good actually. But, and you have to make sure, of course, that you put these errors, uh, uh, you get them out of, this, the, of those pouches streams, uh, because you don't want to have that pouch with an error end up with a patient. Um, because the can, consequences can be severe. But for instance, the wrong medicine, the wrong pill is in a pouch for something uh, uh, that, that that patient doesn't have a disease for. So you sh that patient should not have that pill. Uh, it could be uh, really something uh, happening with him or her if he swallows, he or she swallows that. Um, so what is also true is that at these pharmacies producing all these pouches, it is not possible anymore to manually check all these pouches before it goes to the patients, uh, simply because the amounts of pouches are, are too many. So it's, it's a really about huge amounts of pouches. And, and of course, the, the pharmacy is responsible and should be held responsible for the patient safety. So something should be done and it should be automated in, in, in whatever way. And CUS as a company has come up with a solution for that called the IRIS. Uh, IRIS is a machine uh, which can do the checking of these pouches on, in an automatic way using visual intelligence technology. Um, and that is helping pharmacies to lower their error rate from 1 in 100 to 1 in over 1.3 million pouches. So that's a really big improvement. Um, and that is also true that uh, not only it will uh, um, prevent errors from happening and, and, and be able to solve the wrong pouch, but also it will give you a proof of the pouches that have been dispensed to a patient because this machine, this iris, will take a photo of every pouch that has been produced in a pharmacy. 
And it also helps optimizing the dispensing robot process because uh, if you have a trend line in the errors that you see in the pouch, Iris will give you some advice in how you should optimize your dispensing robot. Um, and of course, that's also being done by visual intelligence technology, so using algorithms to do the actual trick. And we do that based on a dual CCD camera. So we have a photo of every pouch in the RGB, in the normal uh, spectrum, but also in the near-infrared spectrum. And especially in near-infrared, you sometimes see things that you normally would not see if you just look in the RGB. Um, the algorithm is, is such, uh, rely, has such a high reliability that it also is able to distinguish all these different pills, um, uh, including uh, gel caps, for instance, uh, and uh, no matter in which pose these pills uh, are in that pouch. Uh, but it will also detect broken pills and, for instance, crumbs, and sometimes even hairs, but hairs, of course, should not be in that production process anyhow. But sometimes it is, and then it's good that you have uh, an iris because it will keep it out. Um, and um, so the, the, the thing that still is there, that, that also iris is not flawless. So uh, one in, in several pouches, uh, also iris will not be 100% uh, completely sure about if it is the right pouch, yes or no. And that particular pouch will then be put still to a pharmacist to decide on uh, him or herself uh, looking at the photo of that pouch. Um, but, uh, I mean, that's only a fraction of the number of pouches being produced. So it will really bring down the burden of doing this uh, checking uh, to, a, uh, to an extent which is handleable by, uh, by a human being. Anyway. So, yeah, that were the three examples that I had to show of how we use artificial intelligence internally at CUS, helping the digital uh, healthcare system become better. And some final remark remarks then from my side. Uh, so first of all, um, as I've shown probably already and, and, and told you many times, it takes a lot of training data to be able to develop the right quality toolings for uh, hospitals and pharmacies. That's really key. So the cooperation with these kind of, of, of experts is, is really key to us. Uh, second, um, AI can be of great help in digital healthcare um, and, and also in the more daily uh, things like, for instance, securing medication safety at pharmacies something that you might not have thought about uh, before. Um, but it's also true that, uh, especially that is, that is so, if you have a large amount, so huge amounts of official data, uh, like we have, for instance, in these pharmacies, doing 12 million pouches a day nowadays, that's really huge amounts of data. Um, and then AI can play a big role. But it's uh, a final remark maybe also as well that AI is not the silver bullet. So it will not solve everything. It still takes the creativity, uh, the perseverance, and the passion of people to be able to do it. Well, thank you for, uh, for listening to me and paying attention. And uh, hopefully, um, yeah, you've learned something from, from this. Uh, if you have questions or you want to get in contact with me or my company uh, on these three examples or anything else that we might be able to help you with, then please uh, go to our website or give me an email or give me a ring. Uh, thank you for now and have a good evening.